Well, welcome to The Suicide Monk, and today we have Jared Gleaton, and he is an author and school psychologist, and he's going to give us a little bit of his background, tell us why he got into psychology, and, and he's just written a book on food and nutrition and how that plays into psychology, which I think is important for, uh, especially like I'm learning that now, that my nutrition is going to be really important to my mental health. Uh, you know, moving forward, because I've, I've come out from, a, um, you know, this this heavy suicide ideology for 44 years, and I'm on the other side of that now, and I, I can't even really grasp at that thought process anymore. But now I'm like, okay, I need to take care of myself physically, um, emotionally, and, and then nutritionally, I need to do that. And, and uh, a buddy of mine is into... Like they, they eat elk meat and mushrooms foraged from the forest and grow their own food. So they're, they're very uh, much self-sustaining in that stuff. And nutrition is a big part of uh, moving forward and being healthy in, in the mind and body. So, so welcome, Jared. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us, give, give us a little bit about your background and, um, you know. What, do you, what do you tell us something interesting? I'll do my best. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, I'm a school psychologist by trade, so I primarily work with students with disabilities. And I guess my journey into food starts where everybody's journey, it's their childhood. We form these patterns and food choices early on through childhood. And I formed a bond with my father and he played an intricate role. And um, I grew up in Maine. Parents divorced in 96, and I moved with my father to Oklahoma, and you know we just developed that bond and that relationship, and food was a big part. He was Pennsylvania Dutch, oh, and yeah. so lots of pies, whoopie pies, uh, good old good old country Pennsylvania cooking, and it was, it was delicious. We just add butter to everything, and um, you know, I, I grew up with no moderation. And so uh, I, I went to school, got my degree in psychology, got a master's degree in school psychology, and I do a lot of report writing and evaluations. And so I really started exploring the fine dining scene and, and just went crazy with eating everything. And so in 2016, I lost my father, and that was a, a big loss in my world. And at that time, I had ballooned up to about 376 pounds. My father was always worried about my weight. And I realized when I looked down, I couldn't see my feet when I peed that a change needed to happen. And so a lot of people after that loss would have used food as a coping mechanism and just continue to eat and eat and eat. But I decided to use food as a catalyst for strength and for change. And so through a certain methodology, I was able to lose 176 pounds in a year. Wow. No, That's kind of unheard of, right? Like that's yeah. a lot of freaking weight. It is, it, it, you know, it's, it's an extreme example, but there's, it, it, there's no pill, there's no injection. Um, it's just, again, coming up with a good plan, sticking to it and understanding how weight loss works for the majority of people. And during that time, I had to slow down by eating and really savor each bite. And then I just, just tried to discover using the, the five senses, everything that goes into our food choices and everything, every bite how the sight and hearing and the texture and the smell, it all plays a role in how your brain perceives the taste of food. And through that way, I've, I learned my likes and dislikes. I could break through that shell and like anything I wanted. And I also realized that I didn't have to sacrifice the things that I loved in food to still be healthy and still to lose weight. And I think that was a key import is that if you try to deny someone something and say, you cannot, right. you can't eat red meat again. Well, we're Americans. We're going to be like, no, you can't take away my red wheat. Well, somebody says you can't have a, a beer again or a glass of wine. No, you're going to resist that naturally mm -hmm. and become resentful. But if you take a different approach, you can keep those things that you love through moderation. And that, and that is the key. And, through that, I started to write, and through my training in psychology, I started to write critiques and, and do restaurant reviews from a different perspective of um, focusing more on the environment, the atmosphere, the service, and the food, instead of trying to really say, this is good because I like chicken, 
I tried to describe what the chicken was so people could close their eyes and join me on that journey to the restaurant and decide for themselves, does that something sound like something they like? And then, of course, I decided to score to it for me, but at least it was more of a standardized, more of a trying to reduce subjectivity in a very inherently subjective field. Yeah, that's interesting. So how do you describe texture? I struggle with texture. Food looks really good to me, but I struggle <laughs> with most food eating it. Yeah. So the texture thing is, again, what if you think back, we all first off, we all have biological preferences. You know, you might enjoy sweeter tasting things over savor, uh, salty things. You might enjoy the scent of something or what's your favorite color, for example? Mine? Mm -hmm. Green. Why? Uh, I don't know. I just I'm a, I like green. I, I, used, I mean, black used to be my color. Why would you like your color then? Because I was a dark person. It, just, it fit me well. <laughs> you identify with black, but yeah. growing up, if you saw green or a green sign or a green color or a green candy bar or a green anything, would your eye almost quickly go to that first before any other color? Would your brain associate, oh, that's green first? Uh, it might. I've never really paid attention. Yeah. But black was a conscientious choice. You were in a dark place. Black resounded with you, but through it all... Mm -hmm. I'm guessing green was probably there. And that's sort of more of a biological response. We all have preferences from an early age. Either it's formed with memory or it's thrown through, formed through our biology. And so the same thing happens with food. And the same thing happens with texture. And so with texture aversion, it's your body's way of saying that I don't perceive that I enjoy this or like this. But if you can understand the why, you can maybe expand your palate. And so, for example, um, I had sea cucumber a couple weeks ago. Well, it has, you know, it had a delicate sea t a flavor and the texture included um, slightly si slimy and soft at the mm -hmm. beginning notes and middle notes of crunch. And so once you realize that the flavor is there with that, it's meant to be this flavor profile and this texture. If you accept that, you can, ex you can potentially work through that textural problem a little bit more. Right. And, and I've, I've been working at it since I've been around uh, certain people. Um, you know, I, like I tried an egg roll for the first time. I um, had like, like really raw Wagyu. It <laughs> so, like, was it good? It was good. It was, it was hard for me. So I still have some barriers there that. Sure. Um, like I got halfway through the egg roll. But it was really good. Like the flavors were really good. The crunch was really good. My mind took over at that point. And it's like, well, you're you're in uncharted territory, Britain. You need to stop. Like, why, so, why, so the question is, why do you need to stop? Well, why, what in I, the back of your mind was yeah. telling you, Britain, uncharted, uncharted is bad. Right. Well, it's scary. What in, in what and then then go deeper than that though. What is the scary? What is the name of the anxiety or fear? Oh well, of finishing the egg roll. And as soon as you figure that out, you can target that. And as soon as you take that methodology, give the name to the fear, write down a plan, address it. You can apply that to any aspect of your life, regardless of food. You can move past that to realize that what what would have been without telling too much into it. What would have been the downside? The uncharted, if you would have finished that egg roll, what is the worst thing that you could think of that would have happened from finishing that egg roll from beginning to end? What's absolute worst that the fear was telling you, don't finish this? Um, you know, I just get overpowered with there. And I just keep going back to this. I get overpowered with flavor sometimes. So I don't know if that's the, the excuse because no. there's so many times that I'll, I'll be eating. Uh, there's very few meals that I can finish. And mm -hmm. so I try to, I'm almost like a kid's meal type mm -hmm. guy. Um, you know, I can, I can finish a filet, but not always. Yeah. And it's just, I get overpowered with too much. And the same flavor kind of, it really stops me in my tracks a lot of times. And, and that, and that, and so, so again, it goes back to overwhelming of the senses. So taking that egg roll, cutting it into four pieces, having one bite, try something else in the meantime, sip, relax, then come back to the egg roll, have another bite, give your taste buds a break, give your mind a break from thinking about it. 
And once you start doing that, you can finish that egg roll and move on to something else. Yeah. It's just well, coming up. Try that. It's just not very, it's still not quite, I mean, okay. I'm getting, I'm getting better. I'm trying new things. So that's, that's the exciting thing. That's the first step into a brave new world. And that's something yeah. that we as humans, we're, we're pattern seeking individuals. We love our patterns because our patterns are comfortable. Our patterns are familiar. And oftentimes we get psyched out and we try and get outside our patterns and think, oh, this is going to be uncomfortable. This isn't what I'm going to like. When really uh, changing your pattern is just this discovery of something new and expanding your horizons. Sometimes yeah. it's better for better. Sometimes it's for worse. But some one thing I do say and this is something I learned the hard way, especially when we have a negative experience or we spent too much money on something or we didn't have a food. We've learned something from our failures more so than we ever learned from our successes. You will learn more yes. from getting outside the box than your same pattern over and over. And that goes for, for not just food, but all of life. Right. And that's, right. that's an uncomfortable truth for us to realize. That's a yeah. horrible truth. Yeah, it is. But, it, you know, there's something beautiful in the, uh, I call it suffering. Um, sure. Trying to find find a different word for that because it's, I, I don't view it as suffering anymore. Mm -hmm. I feel, I view it as an opportunity to navigate something I've never navigated before in life. And that is a very different response than, you know, two months ago. Absolutely. Well, and then, and then why don't you replace suffering? Cause you just described it, the beauty of right. the unknown. Yeah. There is something to be said about the beauty of the unknown. Yeah. Yeah. So just replace suffering with unknown, and that is so much more lively. Yeah. Well, and see, like, I, and I would tell you that I'm in the worst financial position of my life that I've ever been in. Uh, I haven't overdrawn my account in 20 years, and I just did it. And I'm just like, I, but I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, I've stepped back, and I get to be an observer. And my car was broke down and took all my money. And, and I'm just like, I'm not worried. And, you know, I've always been fed, I've always been clothed, I've always been taken care of, I've always, I've always had enough. Mm -hmm. And just because my bank account's low, and it's not my definition of who I am anymore. And I don't need to worry about those things because, I, you know, there's, if I really get in a pinch, I'm sure I can pull resources somehow. But now I just get to be an observer and how that unfolds and what that looks like. And then I get to be humble in that. And I, I love that. And I get to, you know, I know that I won't always be here, that my life is going to perpetuate forward now. And so this is an opportunity for me to, to relish in being poor and being broken. And even though I've been here all my life, I get to, I get to enjoy it this time. Oh, absolutely. Get, yeah. It's a whole well, different perspective, and that's why food is becoming more and more of a, um, an appealing avenue for me. You don't need a lot of, of money to to enjoy food. You know, one of the one little in, in my book, I wrote a book about all of this. I, I include a recipe that is Alfredo, Southern Italian mm. Alfredo, or no, I can't remember which. But if you take a pack of ramen, that's ninety nine cents. You boil it with some salted water. You take a maybe a half cup of that salted water at the end of the boiling. You drain it. You add maybe two tablespoons of butter to that ramen. You add maybe a quarter of a cup of Parmesan cheese. You stir, stir, stir. You add that pasta water back in. You stir, stir, stir. It's going to emulsify into a creamy Alfredo, and that is original Alfredo, and that's less than $3. Mm. Wow. That is just restaurant quality. You know, you can sit there and say, poo poo ramen noodles, but ramen noodles taste good. Right. If you want to add just barilla noodles or some fresh noodles if you can get a hold of them. Right there, under a restricted budget, you have something that they charge thirty dollars for, you know, an Olive Garden. Right. Yep. Now there's no cream in it. You can add some broccoli if you want. You can add whatever you want to it within your budget, within your health, and it's going to taste amazing. Right. And you know that's that's something that we don't realize of how simple it is. It doesn't need to come from a Bertoli jar. <laughs> It's true. So, and so it's 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 celebrating f food. Food is us. Food is the story of us from beginning to end. And as you can say, if you can discover food and enjoy it, that's something that you're going to have in your life every day. Right. Make the most of it. Yeah. 
And that's what I'm trying to do because, you know, I, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about lately. You know, we're so – in America, we have such access to everything. We do. You know, like anything we want, if we're hungry, we just run down the street, you know, 10 bucks. And, and for the most part, we have enough money to go do that. We do, and but we're also trained from an early age through advertising yeah. to do that. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not a mistake that boxes, billions of dollars go into – Candy, Doritos, all the advertising that's usually at child level, you know, right. the, the, the most valuable um, aisle, candy aisle, they want it as close to, you know, three to five feet because that is where the young, that's where the money is. If you can get the children interested in it into the box, you've already won half the battle visually Then the child's thinking, oh, this is going to taste good, whether it really tastes good or not, because they're exploring their flavors. And so if they, ass- they assign that green, um, neon green box with a cartoon to this sweet tasting snack, they're forever going to think the snack is good until their palate is expanded. But they're going to keep coming back to that snack because it's got that sweet. It's got that that chemical in the brain that says this is wonderful. And so now you're on a perpetual loop of this is good. This is good. And other things right. like it are good instead of. Maybe a home cooked meal or a restaurant that is local that is using sourced outsourced ingredients instead of McDonald's. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to switch the mindset. It's you know, very it's, very difficult. Like to to transfer from that ease to mm-hmm. I'm going to make my own food and mm-hmm. take care of myself and and I'm going to learn it in a way that you know is within my budget and and. Mm-hmm. Whether that be one or two good meals a day, it's going to be one or two good meals a day. I mean, I got three. I, I may not get three, but I know that in human terms, I can live on one to two meals a day. Yeah, you know, hopefully more two than than one, but you know, it's, yeah, and- but I can, and you can get the nutrition necessary out of that, and that's mm-hmm. that's key because I've I've worked my butt off and hard labor and survived on one meal a day for long periods of time. Now I do end up losing weight and then that's probably because my nutrition is not good. So. Well, and we can, we can talk about that. You wind up losing weight because all weight loss at its core for the majority of people. And this is what dietitians they don't really dance around it because if you think about it, how much money is the pharmaceutical are not even big pharma, but the diet pill, this will burn your fat. Right. This will boost your metabolism. Yeah. Wagovi, this injection will cause you to lose weight. What all these things don't really tell you, and the ugly truth is because it, they would lose money if people realized and people figured out a way, is that the only reason that you lose weight ultimately is there could be a health condition, cancer, thyroid. You could gain or lose weight because of those things to be sure. But your body sitting there all day long burns a certain amount of calories. If you don't get up, you don't exercise based on your age, your height, your current weight, um, your, your sex, your body is burning a certain amount of calories. Right. If you eat fewer calories than your body burns a day, you're going to lose weight. It's as simple as that. If you eat more calories than your body burns in a day, you're going to gain weight. Weight. All that you, you know, you've heard of semi-glutide, you've heard of Wagovi, right? The uh injection. I haven't. Helps. Like I'm not familiar with that stuff. So no, I'm sorry. That's okay. You don't need to apologize. So there there's a drug out there um called Wagovi. It's called Ozempic, and it's okay. used primarily for diabetes patients. But yes, yes that's what I use. Yes, and so but Ozempic is an appetite suppressant. I don't know if you have those side effects from it, but it doesn't, it makes it so you're not as hungry. It also slows the digestion. So if you're not as hungry, you're not eating as much. And if you're slowing the digestion, you're full for longer. So this magic shot is being used primarily for weight loss over diabetes these days. And it's the compound semi-glutide, which is what Ozempic essentially is. (laughs) And what people don't realize is, yes, they're losing weight, they're losing weight because their appetite suppressed, so they're not eating as many calories. And without making the lifestyle change to reduce the calories you're eating, what's going to happen when you get off those? Yeah, 
You're going to gain the weight. Yeah. That's right. So when you say you're on Ozempic for diabetes and you lose some weight, my thought is you're probably eating fewer calories than your body is burning in that in that day, week, or month. Hmm. And that Which, is I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not on it. I'm on I'm on oh, ins- I'm insulin dependent, but I am oh. I mean I meant to say I know what it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Sorry. So, so uh, if you're then if you're not on it, still if you're losing weight, it's because you're just not eating more calories. It's you're right. eating fewer calories than yes. your body burns. And yes. That is the essence. That is the key of weight loss. That is all there is to it. If you could figure out how many calories your body is burning just doing nothing all day, if you cut out 500 calories. If you sit down, you measure to the gram what you're eating, and you burn 2,000 calories because your height, weight, age, and sex. And you burn 2,000 calories doing nothing. If you cut out 500 calories, you're going to lose one pound of fat a week. Wow. It's simple math. Now, keep in mind that as you lose weight, your body's trying desperately to hold on to the weight. It doesn't like. It loves its fat. The fat is stored energy. And we have the, our biology wants that fat. It protects our body. It, it, it uses it for a multitude of things. Unfortunately, it's not healthy for us as well. Right. Um, so if you start out at 200 pounds and you lose say 20 pounds and you're down to 180, have you heard of the plateau that people experience during weight loss? Plateau means that they lost, all, you know, 10, 15 pounds. Then all of a sudden they stopped losing weight. Okay. The reason you've stopped losing weight more or less is because as you lose weight, your body needs fewer calories to function. So your body doesn't need as many calories at 180 pounds sitting around all day to to function as it does at 200 pounds. So when you get to 180 pounds under this idea, you have to recalculate your body's basal metabolic rate, how many calories your body burns, and then you have to make adjustments to get past the plateau. Makes sense. Yes, and it's it's very simple, but again, it's, it's, it is work. And we love the idea of Wigobi, this shot, you know, but wow. while you're losing weight, while you're doing the scientific formula, you're training yourself at a new pattern of life. It's really easy to go like this. Right. But yeah. if you can train yourself in the pattern of, well, I'm going to monitor what I eat a little bit more. I'm still going to enjoy that glass of wine. But instead of eight ounces, maybe I enjoy four ounces. I'm still going to have that Snickers bar. But maybe instead of a whole Snickers bar, I have half a Snickers bar. And really enjoy that half Snickers bar as you're eating it. Yeah, yeah. And that's what and as and that also starts to build confidence. Yep. And then things become more beautiful as that happens. Oh, you're and, experiencing your world in a whole new way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and my buddy's got um, he has a drink out that's exogenous ketones, and I've been drinking it, uh, it- with you know kind of looking at my diabetes with that Mm -hmm. but it it curbs my hunger but curbs or however you say that Mm -hmm. but it it really you know suppresses my appetite Mm -hmm. um which i was surprised it also gave me energy and Mm -hmm. um and then as my sugars would drop they would float down instead of drop like Mm -hmm. like plummet Mm -hmm. um so i was i haven't done a lot of research into it but it's uh the name of the company is Holy Water, and it's it's okay. really it's really it's like an exogenous ketone drink, and um, it seems to help. Like because I, you know, like can't necessarily afford like a lot of food, so mm-hmm. this really helps with my hunger pains and and stuff like that. And that, I'm I was surprised at that because I didn't really know that I don't know that much about exogenous ketones and how they work and not mm-hmm. just on the beginning cusp of exercise and how that stuff works and you know the metabolic parts of my body that i don't yeah. really understand and you know just so that's really interesting and then how the mind is affected mm-hmm. by that oh absolutely and you know like i said the metabolic rate you know the, the the thing about metabolic rate is you'll never really know your metabolic rate there's no good way to accurately measure it to the calorie um, but what you can do is again, measure, just like I said, your basal metabolic rate, and it can give you an approximation yeah. and then just use a scale to try and figure out, is this working? Do I need to take out a hundred calories? You know, if that, 
I always say this, you know, if that drink helps you, use it. If, yeah. if you know, ketones, that there's a lot of research that goes into it. There's a lot of research that goes into diets. And my thing is use whatever method that you think is going to work best for you, but always keep in the back of your mind. Calorie, more calories you, if you eat more calories than you burn, you right. gain a gain weight. But if you eat fewer calories than you, you right. burn, you're going to lose weight. And that's the key message. That's something that you can always come back to no matter what you drink, no matter what you eat, no matter how much you exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I like that. So tell me um, about what got you into the psychology field. What, what pushed you towards that? Well, you know, coming up from traumatic divorced home and, and also going through the education system, you know, and I, I love the idea of what makes us motivated as humans, what makes a human a human. And, and the psychology is that it's, it's a pseudoscience, essentially. You know, there's mm -hmm. how do you truly measure an emotion? It, it, there are measurements that measure it, but it's such an interest. It's a standardized subjective field, more so than, than traditional medicine. And it, it's truly fascinating. And I love it. And I really wanted to make a difference. And so I work in public education as a school psychologist, because then I get to work with students with disabilities and come up with ways to help our most vulnerable youth have an opportunity for success. Yeah. Physical disabilities. All disabilities, physical, All disabilities. mental okay. learning okay. disabilities, autism, mm. orthopedic impairments, anything okay. under special education. That's awesome. How, how long have you been doing that? This is my 14th year. Wow. That's amazing. Still love Thank it? You. I absolutely love it. You know what? I, yeah. I, I will see this, and I, I'm not ashamed to say this. I love the teachers, the parents, the students. I'm not too hot on the bureaucracy and administrators. Right, right. I find yeah. that... I've come to the ugly truth that when in this country, and I guess this is something that I was so naive to because I've had a great um, support for years, you know, you, administrators, bosses, they change. And I've, I've had consistency and a really great one. And when that changed, my perspective changed. And I, I, I sit here to just today, I posted on Facebook. I wonder when did titles in public education be more or more important than our students? When did titles become more important than doing what's right, what's ethical, right. what's legal? When did the title mean that we can sweep any of these concerns under the rug? When did that happen? When was that allowed? And I realized it was probably allowed a long time ago, and I was just spoiled. Yeah. It, it did happen a long time ago. Yeah. But that doesn't – and what I realize is by people like me or others standing by – and silently going along with the titles. I don't want to say we're complicit, but it allows it to happen. It yeah, true. change happens when people are willing to speak up. Yeah. Well, in politics, uh, in in a system like that, it's hard to speak up. You risk well, a lot. You risk a lot, but I, I'll say this, and this is this this is something because I'm on a teacher contract. You know, I'm somebody that that really has a. A, a mind where I like to know the nuances of something I'm interested in. If you read the Oklahoma laws in education, Oklahoma laws for Oklahoma laws for teachers, your contract, your district policies. If you read all of these things, you realize that you have more protections than you ever hmm. know. Oh yeah. There's yeah. ways you can do to protect yourself and protect your students, but that's not what you go into the teaching profession for. You're not no. going in there thinking, I need to protect myself. You're thinking, right. I need to do everything I can for this baby, this child that is right. with me, that that this might be the most enriching environment they're going to have all day. Mm -hmm. You're not thinking, I need to protect myself from the title yeah. above me. You, you don't think that. And then when the title above you comes at you, you don't know the ground and the foundation and protections you have. So you work out of fear and you work from home for yep. hours on end and it's a vicious cycle. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That sounds, that's kind of a summary of a corporation as well. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It's and you know, it's one of those deals where, you know, in corporation, do you know the corporate laws? Do you know your corporation's right. policies? Do your corporation's policies align with laws? Do you have a union? What are the union rights? And a lot of times we're so overwhelmed or we're so excited for the opportunity. We're so grateful for the opportunity. And we yeah. think, well, this person brought me in. I, you know, 
that's great. Somebody gave you a somebody gave you an opportunity or a job. It's one thing in corporations, it's another thing in public education, two entirely separate things. You know, I say that, you know, when somebody said, Well, this principal hired me and gave me the opportunity, I say, Well, in the landscape where Oklahoma is has such a huge teacher shortage, you're doing them more a favor than they they doing you a favor for taking the opportunity. Yeah. You know, respect. But that doesn't mean you turn a blind eye to the flaws and the follies of the title. Right. right, right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So going back to your book, uh, what are what what's the name of your book, actually? It's called A Feast for the Senses, The Psychological Art of Eating Well. And uh, it's on Amazon. I believe it's on Barnes & Noble. There's a hard copy. There's an ebook. The ebook's only 99 cents right now. There's also an audio book for right around $10, I believe, on Kindle. And, okay. um, super excited. It's, you know, it's so is it, okay. Is yeah. it, a, is it a book of recipes and like encouragement? Is it, how, how does it target like, uh, weight loss at all? Like where, where did you go with it? It's a diverse, it tells about my story and it, it starts with food and memories. And then it talks about my upbringing. And from there we talk about uh, losing my father, those events. Then we talk about um, weight loss and then implicit and explicit bias, how our in, our biases, our experiences shape our perceptions of food. Then it talks about critiquing food. It talks about how we do food reviews. Then it goes into um, my restaurant reviews of where I've traveled you know, to Michelin restaurants, the local restaurants in Oklahoma, so it touches it. And, and what I want the reader to be able to do is close their, be able to close their eyes and join me at each restaurant and understand the flavor profiles. And then from there, um, I do include some recipes. But what I do is I tie it back to my experiences. I talk about creating recipes just from the flavor profiles that I experienced in, rest in restaurants mm -hmm. without having going to a cookbook. Sure. And also encouraging people to explore the recipes and tweak them for themselves instead of here, this is my cookbook, open this up. So there's some recipes at the end. And then it just, at the very end, we end with a rep, uh, memory talking about how we can reflect on the future. Nice. So go back to uh, the, the weight loss real quick mm -hmm. for, for, for yourself. What, what I, I might've missed it, but what really encouraged you to, lose that kind of weight in such a short amount of time. I mean, what? Sure. So, you know, losing my father was the catalyst and then looking down and not being able to see my feet when I peed was, was right. very right. influential. But ultimately, you know, you hear people say you can only lose 10 pounds a month. And once I understood how the body worked, what I understood is I'm sitting here right now, my body will burn 1900 calories if I do nothing all day long. So if I only eat 1900 calories, I don't need to exercise. I don't need to do anything. And I'll keep this weight. And so at 376 pounds, sitting around and doing nothing meant that I would burn 3,330 calories a day. Wow. So what would happen if I cut from – what would happen if I only ate 2,000 calories? That means that I cut out 1,300 calories. Well, that means every day I am burning without doing anything 1,300 calories. Mm -hmm. There is, there's approximately 3,500 calories in one pound of fat, right? Wow. So in three days, if I just ate 2,000 calories, I will burn one pound of fat. I will lose one pound of weight. So in, in one week, just doing this method, I would lose right around two and a half pounds. Wow. Just by controlling my calories. Now, it didn't, I didn't really change too much what I was eating. It was the amount that I was eating. Right, right. Well, then I thought to myself, what if I exercised every day for 30 minutes? And then I realized it doesn't matter how long you're exercising for. What matters is how many calories you're burning during exercise. If you walk, walk for 30 minutes and you only burn 150 calories, that's, that's half a Snickers bar. Right. So I try to get my heart rate up and I exercise for right around 90 minutes every day. And at 333 pounds, I burned right around 1,900 calories during that 90 minutes. Okay. So I was burning two and a half pounds of what, fat. What kind of exercises were you doing at that, that size? Because that's not mm -hmm. easy. So I was doing an incumbent bike. An incumbent so was, bike? 
I'll be, okay. So that's where I, it's a bike with a seat like this, and I'm just pedaling away. Pedaling. Okay. Yep. And uh, after I lost about fifty, because I lost about fifty pounds in a month. Because if you if you think about it, you lose. You know, I, I was through this method. I was losing right around seven pounds in a week, and I even took it to the higher extreme. After a week, after two weeks of realizing I was losing 15 calories a two week, or 15 pounds in two weeks, right at seven and a half pounds a week, I decided to take it up even more. I said, what about, I want to learn, burn 2,500 calories whenever I exercise. So I jumped it up because I had the time. I have no kids. I had the time to work out and do cardio and weightlifting for right around two, two hours and 15 minutes each and every day. Okay. So I increased that to 2,500 calories. So every other day, I was burning just to exercise alone a pound of fat. Now you add that 1,300 calories on, we're almost to three pounds of fat. And so every three days, three pounds in a week, you know, eight pounds. Yeah. We're, we're getting there. So you had to be hungry. Sure. Like how did you fight that hunger? So a couple of things to fight the hunger. First, what I was eating. I ate a pound of fruit and one pound of vegetables at every meal. Strawberries, peaches, and pineapple was my fruit. And that only is, comes out to about 250 to 300 calories. A pound of fruit gets you full. The next thing is for the vegetables, I would eat one pound of potatoes. I would eat carrots. And that is going to get you even fuller. So that's right around 600 calories, 700 calories. That means I would have 1,300 calories to eat whatever I wanted. Okay. And I'm having my nutrition. I'm having my vegetables. I'm having my fruit along the way. And so if I wanted to make Alfredo, in a, I'm not as hungry, so I could make that Alfredo. I could have that brownie. You know, I could have that, you know, small milkshake. I could have that Snickers bar. Mm-hmm. You know, I, if you want, I can include four out, uh, six ounces of chicken breast. That's only 180 calories. All right, if I want to do a steak, uh, you know, four or five ounces of steak, that might be 300 calories. But I have it to work with because I eat one to two pounds of fruits and vegetables a day. That is not many calories at all. So, what would you say for a diabetic? Because the the fruits and ve- or the fruits are <laughs> high sugar, and they're the fruits are high sugar. Yeah. So for a diabetic, I would consult with your doctor or consult with a, a book to be, do recommended fruits. The next thing I would do, especially for the hunger, is look at the satiety index, S-A-T-I-E-T-Y, satiety index. What the satiety index measures is what fruit, what foods fill you up the most for the longest. Mm-hmm. And so what they found is potatoes, if people like knock potatoes because of carbohydrates, no, carbs aren't the enemy of anything particularly we they get a bad rap but the reason why they get a bad rap is carbs transition to fat quickly um carbs are just stored energy but if right. you sit there and eat a thousand calories of lettuce and you don't burn it off it's going to go to fat it's right. just how it works yeah. so potatoes really fill you up grains really fill you up these check out the things that would fill you up that you like to try and and match that hmm. I do love potatoes. Oof. It's in my blood. I think I I bleed potatoes. They're good. I've been told that, that I need to give them up. I'm like, no, I'm, I can't well, do it. Who told you that you need to give them up? Well, you, anybody that knows I'm diabetic, they're like, oh, you shouldn't eat that. That's carbohydrates. I'm like, I know. I love it. Well, again. What, it's better than know, a Snickers bar for me. And before anyone even tries the, the calorie restriction, I always say talk to your doctor and also realize yeah. something. Your body needs a certain amount of calories and a certain amount of nutrition to function every day. Right. If if you if you sit there and say, "Well, I'm only going to eat 800 calories a day," that's not what I'm recommending. That's a bad idea. Find out how many calories your body needs to function every day and what nutritional value you need. That is going to be incredibly important because you can sit there and just eat 800 calories. It's not going to go well for you, and you have to do some research into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. Anything else, any advice that you would give for, uh, or, or suggestion or anything like that? It's just sort of like you talked about the cravings. How do you get over being hungry? Find something you're interested in 
I loved reading. I read a lot about psychology and food to get my mind off the hunger. I occupied my mind with things other that replaced I am hungry. The thought of mm. I am hungry. I need to eat. Um, get outside. Do some activities. Tr- learn a new th- skill. Anything to get you out of that mindset of I am hungry. And it'll fall away. Yeah. It replaced the behavior that leads you to stress eating or hunger eating with something else. Replace the idea of eating with something else. Video game a movie, a novel, maybe you build something, go do some arts and crafts, try and find and discover something new and realize this isn't a perfect thing. It might, there's going to be good days and bad days. If you give in and you eat that burger and fries, you're like, I just have to, and you shove it in your mouth and and you feel bad afterwards. Realize (laughs) it's recoverable. It's not the end of the world. Wake up tomorrow with a renewed vigor and realize I can still do this. I've got this. It just means I didn't I didn't lose any weight today or tomorrow or the next day. But that doesn't mean I can't get this ship right in real quick and realize it's okay. We're all human. Yeah. Well, and there's something about giving yourself grace. I mean, I, I have to. Absolutely. I'm, I'm doing that more and more with myself because, you know, I struggle with, um, well, I struggled pretty heavily with anger. And yeah. so. And even when I'm getting frustrated now, and this is my thing, so maybe it's food for somebody else, but I have to give myself grace. And instead of Absolutely. beating myself up, I'm like, you know, that, you know, that's part of your reactionary uh, system, Britain. It's okay. And I move past it. Instead of being like, you're such an idiot, you're so stupid, and, you know, mm-hmm. I, instead of beating myself up anymore, it's like, no, I'm just going to give myself grace and move past it. Because as I do that, I start doing less and less of that very reaction. We fall into a cycle. We're we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. And again, it's you, you learn more from your state mistakes than your successes. So if your anger, after you've had that moment, take a moment to self reflect and realize what made me anger. Why did that control? Why did that thing that made me anger control me in that moment? And realize that ultimately that thing didn't make me angry. I reacted angrily. What are some things that we can do to, to help my reaction last time? And that's the hardest trick that anyone can do. That's something I, at work, that's something I deal with. Just when I hear some, a certain person's voice or they say something, I'm already agitated. And I have to, I work very hard on realizing it's just their tone. It's just who they are. My experience is shaped by perceptions of them. Let's hear their words and then focus on their words, not my dislike for this person's ethics, morality, all the other things that go into it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate uh, all the information and especially with the, you know, and this is an unfamiliar territory for me as far as weight loss. I've always struggled to gain weight, okay. um, but, you know, depression and, and diabetes being type one have, have, you know, taken its toll and it keeps me thin. So, but now I'm starting to maintain Good. this, this evenness with my weight. I'm actually uh, gaining a little bit, which was nice because it, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting back to where I think my healthy level of weight gain is. And that wonderful. Yeah. So like the mind is healing, the body's starting to heal. And, you know, it's going to take time for those things, uh, you know, because of the path I was on. I just let everything go. And um, but now it's time to get strong again. And so I really appreciate you being here. I, re- I appreciate you reaching out. Uh, I can't wait to to look into your book and, and see what's in there. Thank you. Yeah. I look forward to, to hearing from you and, you know, we'll see you on the good side. Sounds good, Britton. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Good, sir. Yeah. Jared Gleaton, thank you. Appreciate it.